Again, good morning. My name is Shaitia Sproul. I am one of the program managers for the Treasurer's Office of Economic Empowerment, and I'm here to welcome you today to another installment of our 2021 Equal Pay MA Roundtable in honor of Black Women's Equal Pay Day. For those of you who don't know, Black Women's Equal Pay Day was actually August 3rd this year, but we, we had a lot going on that day. So we decided to do it on August 5th today. Um, you can join us, whether again, you're watching on Facebook, you can still register. We'll drop the link in the comments on Facebook to receive any of the information we talk about today and to learn more about our lovely panelists. This is our agenda. This is what we're going to work through in our hour together. I'm going to go through our welcome as, <laughs> as I already started. I'll introduce our panelists. Then I'll hand it over to our moderator, Ms. Denise Jordan. We will have time later this um, morning, this morning <laughs> for our audience Q&A, as well as some closing remarks. So again, thank you for joining us. But before we get into the, the panelists and our conversation, I just have to let everyone know we are recording this webinar. We are also streaming live on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we will be dropping all of the relevant links that we talk about today in the chat. But again, you will receive a follow-up email and then feel free to share the live stream link on your Facebooks, on your Twitters, um, the registration link with friends that might want to catch up with this recording later. We also will be sharing more Equal Pay and Make content in that follow-up email. So be sure to register if you haven't already. Um, everything that we talk about today will go out in an email tomorrow. But if you want to stay up to date for our uh, other upcoming Equal Pay and May roundtable conversations, we will be posting those as we get closer to the date. We should look forward to one um, in September and October. And then if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can always email us at equalpayma at tre.state.ma.us. I know it's a long email, but that, that'll get us. <laughs> and then finally, you can always copy, or excuse me, follow the conversation on Twitter and Facebook using the hashtag equalpayma. Really quick before I get into our panelists, we want to say thank you to our partners on this session, which is the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women and the Massachusetts Women of Color Coalition. Both have Facebook pages that you can find using the, the handles below the images you see on your screen. And again, we'll be posting all of the links in our um, chat box on Zoom. So let's get into it. Introducing one of our panelists, Ms. Adaisy, and New, excuse me, Adeze Ndurgaba. She is an advocate for equity and human rights for women and girls and the coalition lead for Wage Equity Now. She currently also works full-time for Google and formerly interned for the Office of the First Lady under the Obama administration. And if you wanna learn more about Adeze, we have her um, bio, full bio here. Feel free to take a screenshot, check it out and we will post how to contact her soon. Next, we have Ms. Leslie Ford. She is the founder and CEO of Mom's Hierarchy of Needs, a community where parents can learn to manage stress and make space for self-care and growth, while also helping employers use data to retain working parents. Um, she's also been featured in publications like the Washington Post, the uh, Slate, and Parents Magazine. Again, her bio is on the screen. Feel free to screenshot, learn more about Ms. Leslie. Next, we have Janae McDonald. She is the Family Child Care Coordinator for the SEIU Local 509. She is also a mother of three, lifelong resident of Springfield, and she's been a political activist for over eight years. So this is Janae. And then finally, our awesome moderator, Ms. Denise Jordan. Jordan is a lifelong resident of Springfield as well. She serves as the director of the Springfield Housing Authority, and she is the vice president of the Massachusetts Women of Color Coalition Western Region. And her bio is on the screen. I'll pause for everybody who wants to take a screenshot. And without further ado, I will pass it over to Ms. Tim. Thank you so much, Shatia. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you all to our discussion on Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Uh, we are in for a treat today. Um, I'm going to 
read some questions uh, to our panelists. And like you, I'm going to learn a lot today. As Shaitia said, my name is Denise Jordan. I serve as a uh, founding member of the Mass Women of Color Coalition, and I proudly represent the wild, wild west out here in the uh, Western region. So I want you all to sit back because we're going to learn a lot about Black Women's Equal Pay Day. So we're going to jump right into it, and I'm going to start with a daisy. A daisy, how did COVID affect Black women and our status in the equal pay conversation? Uh, black women disproportionately face health disparities compared to white women, and this became abundantly clear during the COVID-19 pandemic. How have these health disparities, uh, such as increased health care um, costs and lack of access, both within and outside of the context of the pandemic, affected overall wealth and participation in the labor force? Thank you so much for the question, Denise. And, um, that is quite a loaded question, but uh, first and foremost, um, thank you, Shatia, Denise, the Office of the Treasurer and Receiver General, um, Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women, and the Massachusetts Women of Color Collective um, for convening this forum, facilitating this critical conversation, and bringing us all together in communion. And thank you so much to everyone on the call and live stream for being here. So um, first and foremost, COVID-19 highlighted the countless social and health disparities that have existed in the Black communities for um, centuries within the US. And um, however, the pandemic did not affect all social groups the same. So we saw that it adversely impacted the areas marked by high density in um, living spaces where residents cannot buy healthy food and sheltering in place was not an option, which greatly impacted the Black community. We saw it impacted women and mothers who had to take on additional household and caregiving um, responsibilities and assume a double shift. But um, also many women had to downshift their careers and stepped out of the workforce entirely since the onset of the pandemic. So what then becomes your predicament if you occupy both identities, Black and women, um, to that effect, to that end, we have seen compounding um, effects. So the overrepresentation in consumer facing jobs, poverty and lack of wealth are all aspects that put black women in high levels of physical and financial danger during the pandemic. The hospitality, childcare, leisure, retail and food industries, food service industries are oversaturated by black women and pose significant pandemic risks. So these are jobs that um, could not be done remotely. And um, secondly, these were also um, occupations where people were able to um, afford to take time off and um, many paid, sleep, paid sick leave not being guaranteed in the US was also um, a factor. So along with paid sick leave, the inadequacies um, in policy in the US um, that left other social safety nets such as health insurance, family medical leave, and um, other benefits out of reach for many in low paying consumer facing jobs. These industries took um, the biggest pandemic related losses through layoffs, cut hours, and efforts to social distance, resulting in the increased financial instability and mass unemployment that has disproportionately affected Black women. And then as it concerns poverty, this intensified the impacts of COVID-19. Women of all racial and ethnic backgrounds are more likely to live in poverty than white non-Hispanic males. But this is especially true for black women and the social and economic consequences of the pandemic have significantly more potential to, to disrupt and overwhelm the lives of those in or close to poverty. Um, so again, lack of access to social safety nets and ability to afford high medical uh, costs and lack of resources to prepare and protect against the coronavirus put our community in higher danger of not only contracting the virus, but also sustaining um, the same, the most financial damage and health risks. So um, on the same coin as poverty, the gendered and racialized wealth, wealth uh, divide further aggravated the social and economic effects of the pandemic for black women a family's ability to accumulate and grow capital, whether it be through their income or other assets such as home, retirement um, plans or stocks, 
play a major role in how they can react to disruptions um, or crisis in their lives. Having money in the bank can be the difference in um, between a doctor's visit being a mild inconvenience or a severe financial uh, setback, which in turn has its own consequences. And in general, women have less wealth than men, but this disparity worsens with consideration of race. So in Boston, um, white households have a median wealth of about $250,000, while Black women only have a median wealth of a couple hundred dollars, close to nothing. So in these cases, Black women in particular um, do not have the financial standing to withstand one financial crisis, let alone multiple. Um, and then in the case of the pandemic, the social and economic crisis are ample, um, whether it be a doctor's visit, a layoff, reduced work hours, or the need to stay at home to take care of oneself or loved ones. And so finally, the pandemic was an unexpected development in 2020, but its social and economic impacts on Black women were not. Um, throughout through a history of institutional um, discrimination and disenfranchisement, Black women were left in the most precarious position to deal with the pandemic and our overrepresentation in the lowest paying consumer facing markets left little room for us to access uh, social safety nets and simultaneously these industries saw the layoffs. So um, the high poverty and gendered and racialized wealth gap heightened um, the weight of the day to day disruptions during the pandemic, turning what would otherwise be mild inconveniences into severe crisis with a set of setbacks. Thank you, Daisy. So um, you spoke a lot about families and specifically women being impacted. Leslie, your organization, uh, Moms of Hierarchy and Needs, helps employers use data to retain working parents. What kind of data do you collect how do you and your partners use the data to support working moms? It's an excellent question. So I started studying the impact of the pandemic on work and life, March 30th of 2020. Now at the time, I thought it might be a very quick little study. <laughs> I thought, oh, let's see what's going on, how this will impact us over the next you know, few weeks or a few months. But um, the study is still running. <laughs> Um, I now have over close to 2,400 parents who've participated, and it's overwhelmingly like 97% women. So in the study and throughout the waves, um, what has been consistent, whether asked what people need for their health, for their productivity, for their well-being, or their happiness, um, the answers have been childcare. <laughs> flexibility at work, and access to mental health care. Um, so those are intersectional issues that have kind of endured throughout the pandemic. And some of the more specific questions that I will ask, whether, I'm, whether it's my audience of, of moms who are you know, overwhelmingly kind of following the site, or the you know, now thousands of employees that I have surveyed on the client side, you know, people need accommodations. They might need a special setup at home to be able to make remote work work for them. And you know, as a Daisy had described you know, so beautifully, with a difference in generational wealth, with a difference in access, more urban, you know, black women and black families, families of color are often in more urban environments. You, know, you may not have a home office, right? You notice I'm in my daughter's room right now. Um, you may not have access to a second monitor or to a great place to set up your Zooms. You might need your employer to support you through that. A lot of people are struggling with transportation issues. I saw it as a sub-theme throughout the study that whether you know women are in rural settings, um, or even sometimes in urban settings, the difficulty of navigating childcare or elder care. And if they were in essential roles, and this was often what pushed a lot of um, women, particularly you know, mothers and particularly black mothers out of the workforce, not having access to transportation for themselves or for their children, not having access to transportation in a crisis when um, schooling was disrupted or other infrastructure was disrupted. So although people had a lot of very you know, individual needs um, throughout this time, 
those were the major themes. And what I've shared very you know, vocally with employers and with clients has been, you know, how, how do you, through your policies, through your benefits, and through the, the work norms and culture, give people flexibility, and that's real flexibility, right? That's not telling people they have flexibility because they're working at home, because a lot of people are working at home right now. But I keep seeing my study like, oh, yeah, my manager is still sending me messages at nine and 10 and 11 o'clock at night, or I'm being asked to do the same job, or I have the same key performance indicators, even though I have half the staff and our team is even leaner than it was before, or I have my children at home and I have, you know, 10 times the laundry and 10 times the dishes, but I have the same goals at work. How can I do this? So really looking at flexibility in terms of flexible expectations, not just flexible schedules or flexible work location. Creating psychological safety in the workplace. You know, most people um, in across my studies, whether men or women, are very reluctant to raise their hands and say, you know what, I'm having trouble at home. Um, I really need some support or I really need to renegotiate my deadlines or I really need to renegotiate how often I can be in meetings, you know, because I have a baby at home or a toddler at home or I'm caring for an ill parent. People need their health insurance, right? They need their incomes and they're desperate not to lose those stability markers during this time of crisis. So encouraging employers to create the environment where there is psychological safety, where vulnerability is modeled and shared and celebrated um, is really important. The third is destigmatizing access to mental health care and ideally helping people cut the line. Long before the pandemic, it was really hard to get a mental health care provider, especially for children. And children's mental health needs uh, reached crisis levels probably three or four months into my study, uh, right in parallel, right, with the challenges that mothers and parents are facing. So being able to help employees get access to mental health care, ideally paying for it and making it um, just part of the conversation and normalizing that conversation. Then the fourth is really helping to curate or pay for child care and elder care. I think this also was something that impacted a lot of black women and in communities of color, you know, daycares closed, a lot of child care facilities closed or were on and off closing and reopening based on COVID cases and people still had to pay for them. So they're still paying for care, yet they're at home with their kids or they might in some cases have moved in to care for an aging parent or for family members who they don't wanna see in a facility during a global health crisis. So people are navigating all these difficulties and the, the employers and managers can make an incredible difference in whether people stay in the workforce or not through this time. Denise, we can't hear you. Thank you, Leslie. You touched mm -hmm. upon a couple of um, subjects specifically about employment and some of the challenges that women have in the workforce during this pandemic. I wanna shift gears um, and talk to some of the issues regarding collective bargaining. So I'm gonna to go to Janae. Janae, um, black unionized workers have historically been paid better than their non-union counterparts. And the union movement has once again gained momentum in recent years. Do you believe unions are effectively marketing themselves as proponents of the fight against racial economic injustice or do you believe they could do a better job of centering people of color, particularly women of color, in their efforts to gain more union members? Thank you for that question. It's really important. It's a really important topic. Um, you know, I also want to disclose that while unions sometimes seem to have, um, you know, a white face or even white male faces, it's really important to highlight the role that Black women have played in union membership and understanding the fact that unions were not originally organized in occupations that Black women were working in, uh, whether it's domestic work, uh, agricultural work, um, or even like very, very, very entry-level administrative roles. And so versus now, Black women are very representative in the labor markets that we're seeing um, represented in sectors with high union membership. And some of these sectors are healthcare, early education, um, administrative roles, and other direct care positions. And so this is why 
when we see union membership declining, the racial wage gap is actually widening because union membership is so much comprised of people of color that the less we have participating, the more that we're risking and gaining equity and power. And so unions are truly solving. And since the 70s, they've had a history of truly solving for wage, uh, wage excuse me, it's kind of a tongue twister, race, wage gap, um, especially through collective bargaining. And SEIU specifically uh, has a history of lifting up uh, women workers. And we saw this in the 70s with administrative and clerical workers um, who wanted to organize in Boston. And women were talking about the disparities that they were facing with work assignments, um, you know, treatment from their white male bosses, facing an enormous amount of sexual harassment, um, you know, pay disparities, and even the segregation of positions where there were black women upstairs in the data entry um, section and where the white women were downstairs in the more front facing public secretarial positions. And when they wanted to organize, there weren't any other labor unions that were willing to take the risk, um, you know, to organize them. They thought maybe it was just a phase of the movement. They didn't see, you know, how they could see it growing. And of course, many of the leaders of these other locals were white men. Um, however, it was Service Employee International Union that was willing to organize um, the nine to five movement, which is this big movement that started in Boston and becoming a local. And it, they actually ended up involving into one of the largest membership organizations of working women in the United States. Um, so it's no secret that union jobs pay higher. Denise, just like you mentioned, um, you, know, you, you talked about some of the data and it's because of the organized power that it gives workers to have a say in their actual working conditions, right? And so where else are you going to find where the employer comes to the employees on an annual or uh, every two years, every three years and says, you know, Denise, what do you want to see? What are the changes that you want in your working condition? I'm going to give them to you and then we're gonna make sure that it's legally binding. You don't see that anywhere else outside of within the union. And so when we talk about better regulations and grievance processes, better hiring and promotion practices, and of course the collective bargaining for higher pay and other benefits, um, black women workers are more likely to have employer provided health insurance and retirement plans than, non -union, than their non-union worker uh, counterparts. And I say all that to say this to get to the end of your question, which is there's always more work to be done, right? And I started this out by trying to dispel the myth that unions you know, are only comprised of white people and understanding that historically there has been a face of it being very white facing or very white male facing. Policy tables are still very much white. Um, considering the role that unions play in transforming policies, unions need to be centering people of color in these conversations and putting them in a position to lead. Right here in Massachusetts, some of uh, you all may be familiar with the Raise Up Massachusetts Coalition. This is a coalition that worked to pass some of the most comprehensive paid leave in the country, not in Massachusetts, in the country. We're still doing work to see this happen on a national level and even using Massachusetts um, as an example of how it can be done. And you know, there was heavy, heavy union presence there. The union really leveraged their political capital um, and not to mention the impact that a policy like paid leave has widely on employees and positions that may not have much flexibility, which also happen again, be comprised of black women or people of color. And so since unions help lead that type of policy, um, it's really important that we're constantly working to center black women around these tables. I can't tell you, Denise, how many meetings, um, uh, bills, you know, if, when we're in the room and the bills are being written, I've been the only black woman from time to time in these rooms. And so that's evidence right there that there's more that needs to be done to make sure we're having this happen. When we even look at the building trades, right, we're seeing more developers um, holding the construction accountable to diversity quotas, right? And we saw this even out in Western Mass when we did MGM and how we had to come up with this community partners network to build a coalition and an effort to make sure that we're recruit, recruiting um, uh, people so that they can meet their quota, right? And, and at times that is a struggle in certain regions. This is all because there's more that needs to be done to recruit black women and organize labor positions. If unions expect to continue to flourish in a post-Janus world, then there needs to be more marketing to black women and people of color at large. And it needs to be done in a way that's gonna help them make the direct connection between what their livelihood is like as a unionized uh, worker versus without having the union. Black workers are more likely to be union members than white workers because of the inequities that black people naturally face in the workplace. So there's also this desire for added advocacy that comes with union representation. 
Um, you know, I make it a part of my personal goal. I've been an advocate. It's a part of the fabric of who I am. Um, I have felt the most equity in the workplace than I've ever felt by working for a union. And I look forward to dedicating my career and continuing the work. Thank you, Janae. And as you talk about the evolution of uh, the unions and engaging women, you know, I, I think about Lisa Clausen with Women in Trades, um, their organization trying to get women to be more invested in joining the trade. So thank you for that. Um, at this portion, I want to open up uh, the next two questions to all of the panelists. And, um, you know, you all can figure out who's going to answer first. I'm going to give you all two minutes just so that you all have an opportunity to answer. Um, and then from there, I will um, pass the mic over to Shaitia and she'll take some of the questions from our participants. So the first question is, which policies would you like to see put in place by organizations or by government that would support Black women currently in the workforce or those looking to get back into it? I would like to go first if that's, if that's at all possible. Uh, and I have to toot this up again, again with the coalitions and the union presence. Um, policy that needs to happen is universal child care. If we wanna talk about women being able to enter the workforce, re-enter the workforce, especially after a pandemic, we need to talk about universal access to childcare. Right now we have a coalition called the Common Start Coalition. Massachusetts is set uh, to be on its way to providing universal access to childcare. It also needs to make sure that it's really affordable so that we're removing the burden of early education and care off of the families. And also what it's going to do is it's going to provide um, additional pay and funding to the providers that are providing the work. Right now, the current system that we have, childcare workers are underpaid. They work anywhere between 10 and 12 hours. And we work with every contract to increase their benefits and their wages. But what we're also talking about is over 90% of childcare workers are women and more than half of them are women of color. So this, uh, this legislation is also going to bring racial equity to the table and it's gonna make sure that women who are also the first nurturers and the caregivers and more likely to have to sacrifice their careers because of childcare and opportunity uh, to sustain their families. Thank you. Leslie? I'm, you yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in next. And I, I agree with Janae completely. I'm a, I'm a huge, um, advocate for the Common Start legislation and for childcare. I think it would be game changing uh, for women. I'll add that something that has disturbed me <laughs> for a long time, but particularly in doing this research is just how many women um, and particularly mothers, which is the community that I tend to have more access to, are being not just, I mean, they're not opting out, right? They're being kicked out, pushed out, forced out of the workforce. And, you know, even before the pandemic, you know, before this time of crisis, motherhood bias, pregnancy bias, those things were rampant in the workplace. Um, people are either kind of shuttered out of opportunities for promotion or growth or kicked out altogether. So I'd love to see something like the WARN Act, which exists in New York City here, or more broadly nationally, where people get like a 90 day warning uh, before a position is terminated, because most in most positions, um, especially if someone is not very tenured, severance is a thing of the past, right? The severances are anemic. P companies are not paying people uh, when they're terminated in any reasonable way. If they have to choose COBRA for their health insurance, the costs are um, prohibitive for many families, particularly for families that are black or brown or in communities of color. So giving people more of a window, um, an adequate warning, which I think particularly in the black community where we lack the generational wealth would be um, life altering for a lot of people to have that space and that time to transition smoothly. Um, and I guess another thing that I would add on the childcare worker front, a lot of childcare workers are also on public assistance programs. A lot of people do not realize that um, because they're overwhelmingly women and overwhelmingly women of color. So what I would love to see is that childcare workers or elder care workers were protected where they could continue to receive their public assistance, housing and healthcare that they desperately need because in an expensive uh, city like Boston or in a high cost of living area, um, they need the subsidies um, in addition to the protected wages. And what happens are a lot of people in the childcare field 
they're pushed to the margins, they go under the table, uh, they're paid off the grid, and they lose the protections like access to social security when they're older, access to disability, access to paid leave through the state paid leave program. So those are a couple things that I love to see change. Thank you. Well, there are a few, um, but for one, having organizations and government back um, the, the bills that the Wage Equity Now Coalition, um, H 2020 or S 1196 and act relative to transparency in the workplace, which will require employee employers to report critical wage gap data and the demographics of their top 10 earners um, would be critical. Um, this is information that would be essential to understanding the magnitude of wage gaps and measure progress towards racial and gender equity, wage equity. Um, regards to government, there are a lot of policy changes, but I think above all, government needs to rework its approach to policy making. So um, currently, a lot of the centralization on racial and gender disparities, and hence public policy interventions on these disparities, as it pertains to race, structures on the conditions of Black men, and gender on the conditions of white women. So I would like to see legislators adopt a more intersectional approach to policy making that accounts for the fact that because Black women occupy uh, two marginalized statuses, Black and woman in America, um, our circumstances are quite uh, unique. Um, and then regards to employers, um, there are various different things. Right now, there's a lot of focus and commitments to hiring more um, people of color in the in their um, in the companies but you need to equally uh, accompany the hiring efforts and the recruiting efforts with also how to retain these employees if you're bringing people into the workforce and they're leaving within two or three years because it's a very unhealthy hostile environment then you're not truly achieving the core objectives that you have set out to um, to achieve so um, certainly um, conducting more allyship training, unconscious biases, and setting a zero tolerance standard for microaggressions or just uh, the certain things about the culture, such as um, if you're having a, you know, event that um, maybe women or black women would not be comfortable with, you know, how do you model inclusivity in the workplaces? And also to ensure that you have managers who are aware of these things and can serve as mentors and sponsors because black women actually state that uh, they don't feel as though they have managers who advocate for their career progression. So ensuring that you have managers who are um, equipped with the knowledge to actually advocate for their employees of color, women of color um, would be also very critical. Thank you. So my final question is, what advice would you give to black women that are looking to start a new business or for those black women already in business looking to exp expand their existing business? I'm happy to, to start with that one. Um, not every business requires venture capital funding. I think that we all need to kind of understand that there's this path to entrepreneurship that is celebrated and it's the kind of Silicon Valley, you know, rocket ship, you know, billion dollar valuation path. And, um, you know, the, usually the white male who's living on ramen noodles and, and working from a garage or working from his parents' basement. And, you know, that's not, that's not the reality for most black women, right? That's not our, that's not our path. That's not our journey. And I think it discourages, um, you know, many women from thinking about different models for their business. Not every business needs VC funding and you can look at whether it's bootstrapping your business and starting in one way and having a path that opens up um, you know, productization or monetization in a different uh, way once you have established yourself in the first, you know, several months or the first year is one option. Um, but I encourage Black entrepreneurs like, like myself, like look for the revenue, uh, look to monetize, look to, um, you know, fund your business through revenue. <laughs> and there's nothing more powerful than that. Um, 
And I see a lot of women, particularly women of color who are like in this cycle of, you know, chasing funding from traditional venues. And although there is a lot of attention being paid on how um, biased uh, the funding process is and how few black women do get funded, it still hasn't changed significantly. So I say, when we start to like become aware that not every space was designed for our success and look for the workarounds, it creates some new opportunity. I would like to um, just lightly touch on that. Um, one of the biggest things that I always like to say is, especially black women, um, but black folks in general is step away from the food service industry as entrepreneurship, right? And when I think about different areas and sometimes when we think about being an entrepreneur and starting a business, it doesn't always have to be a restaurant, you know? And those are, and doing a restaurant is something one that requires quite a bit of capital to be able to do. So, you know, to kind of going back to what you talked about, Leslie, is there's a lot of things that are still within the service industry that can be done that don't require a lot of capital. And also talking about what you mentioned, Leslie, about tapping into existing funding. And to be able to tap into that funding, you need to make sure that you have the appropriate business structure to do so. So registering with the Secretary of State as a woman-owned business or as a minority-owned business, so that again, when these contracts are out there and folks need to you know, be able to say that they gave X amount of dollars to diverse vendors, that we're able to take advantage of that. But you have to make sure that you have the appropriate business structure um, to do so. And so, you know, network and take advantage of many opportunities and all the opportunities may not always be funding opportunities, right? Some of the opportunities may be access to information, access to the process on how to register on how to gain um, access to the funding. So I would say to step away from the food service industry. There are other things that we can do and that we are very talented in doing and make sure that you have the appropriate business structure to take advantage of these dollars that are coming down. A few things uh, for one, seek out mentors. Uh, as you undergo this journey, it's important to have a support system that is there to emotionally support you, um, <clears throat> offer any strategic guidance and keep your spirits lifted. Entrepreneurship is not an easy venture, so form a supportive circle around you that will keep you afloat. And um, this is more for folks who are don't even know where to get started and like want to pursue entrepreneurship, but they don't even know what to do. Um, Understand the market and how your product company or brand will fill the gap in the market. I think we're naturally equipped to do this because too often we're the ones who are being unrepresented or left behind entirely. We saw this with uh, in the beauty industry for the longest time, makeup foundations did not match deeper skin tones or undertones. And now you see brands that are, you know, Fenty Beauty, congratulations to Rihanna on being named the billionaire. But we see that she expanded the shades and she filled a gap that was in the market. We see this with little things like band-aids and what is considered uh, flesh color or undergarments, shoes, the nude colors are like, you know, whiter skin tones. So there's a lot of areas and, you know, niches in the market that we can tap into and fill that existing void and we can naturally make those connections. And then finally, um, prioritize your wellness. And this encompasses different things, setting boundaries, being selfish for a change, taking up space and other things that center your, your well-being. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to thank all of the panelists for the uh, first part of our program, answering all of our formal questions. Um, as a 34-year uh, employee of the Commonwealth and the city collectively, and being only 45, um, I would like to thank all of the information that you all provided. You touched on everything in such a short time, but you really provided us with a lot of powerful information. You talked about education, um, employment, wages, mental health, um, the unions. So um, I want to just thank you for your expertise and your wisdom and encourage um, the audience to really you know, listen to some of the things that the panelists have talked about. Follow the money and make sure that you're in tune and, and you're paying attention to who's getting the money and then raising issues when you see who's not getting the money. So at this time, I wanna turn the program over to Shaitia who will take questions from our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And thank you to all of our panelists. Before we get into the questions, I really enjoyed today's conversation and thank you for highlighting all the different perspectives and experiences because I heard a lot that I was resonating with. So thank you. 
Um, at this time, I'm gonna start asking some questions that came while you all were talking. The first question I see is for Ms. Ford. Can you please explain how, excuse me, where you receive your data regarding equal pay? Oh, um, well, I'm not tracking equal pay in my study, um, but I have, it, you mean as it relates to Black Women's Equal Pay Day, I know there's a couple of different bodies that track that information and what day of the year and why we are um, kind of where we're at as it relates to the pay gap. I think the question might be about that. Um, for my data and my studies, I have people from all over the country who are responding to a survey. Um, it's national, it's a little bit international since March 30th of last year. And for anyone who wants to take it, please, momshierarchyofneeds.com if you're a mom or a dad, uh, it is open to all parents. And so I've been measuring not pay, but work conditions, quality of life, self-care, and what we need to be able to flourish through this kind of chaotic time. Thank you. And my next question is for Ms. McDonald. How can I become more active in the legislation process when it comes to having a seat at the table? And then she goes on to say, knowing when bills are being reviewed and passed. I would say get involved, uh, get involved with some social justice organizations, some economic justice organizations. And, you know, a part of this in the beginning, if you're not, you know, if you don't work for an employer that is involved in a type of work like this, like I am now, um, you know, I got my start by volunteering my time to become educated on what the issues were and where the advocacy was needed. Um, I started out with uh, Neighbor to Neighbor in the Western Massachusetts chapter. We also have the Western Mass, the Women Health um, Equity Collective. Uh, we have, you know, the Pioneer Valley Project. Out East, you have the Coalition for Social Justice. I mean, there are several organizations that you can get involved with. Also, what you can do is look to the legislators because they know who the organizations that are involved because we're the ones giving them the legislation so that they can file it. Um, so, you know, really holding your local elected official accountable and helping to guide you and point you in the right direction to become more involved. Lastly, I think one other thing too is really important to um, remember is you don't have to be a part of an organization if you wanna see legislation filed. You can actually give it to your legislator um, and, the, and they will file it. Now, as far as getting it pushed and making sure that the bill doesn't die, you know, that is something that's going to require more formal coalition building oftentimes. Um, but there are several ways that you can get, there are other churches also that get involved um, on the advocacy tip, not lobbying or anything like that. because you don't wanna jeopardize their nonprofit status, but do get involved with advocacy. And so I would say, look to your local community um, I'll put my email in the chat and I can also, you know, send you a list of different organizations as well. And I'd just can like I, to hop in. Sorry, go ahead, Leslie. I was just going to also just add one resource because I'm a proud member of BECMA, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. And they're doing, I think, some really incredible work to raise awareness to support the Black community and Black businesses. So I would encourage join their mailing list or if you're a business owner, um, you know, I'm, I've been very pleased to be a member there. And places like BECMA and the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women even, they put out legislative priorities and you can find those um, lists on their websites oftentimes. I know I'm a commissioner on the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women and we recently finalized our list of priorities, which does include the common um, start child care legislation. So anywhere that you can find Kind of folks that are following the legislation is also a good idea to link up with and follow what they're following too. Um, but thank you for sharing that awesome, all of those resources, Leslie and Janae. My next question comes from Katrina. How do we support women who are interested in no longer receiving federal assistance, but unable to due to the lack of support and or resources? And she goes on to say unable to make certain amount of money, change of health insurance and unable to get out of the cycle. It sounds like uh, that's another question around the cliff effect, right? Yeah, and so that's mm -hmm. one of the things, um, you know, we represent 
just a quick little background about 509 and my role as a family child care provider. I'm a chair family child care coordinator uh, leading the department. And so we represent all the family child care providers throughout Massachusetts who serve families with um, subsidies. And I know we talked about foundation funding from the Common Start Coalition and some of the other sustainability grants that we see coming around. And so what really needs to be done is there needs to be some coordinated efforts to have uh, conversations with these state agencies like DTA and MassHealth to facilitate the conversations around the CLIP effect. And what does that mean? Now, I know that conversation can get a little dicey because there's also some federal oversight for things like that. Um, but that is certainly one of the conversations that 509 is having for their members uh, for family child care, because again, some of them make so little they are on public assistance themselves. We're working to provide them with more, more money, give them foundation uh, payments, but then providers are facing potentially losing um, some of their benefits. There's actually language um, specific to the child care sector and some of the federal dollars that are coming down around um, reducing the cliff effect. And so getting some clarification on what the legislature means with that um, and working with the state agency to clarify. So I would say that um, there definitely needs to be some work done with the DTA and Mass Health State Agency to address that because they would be the ones um, to help monitor and you know reduce or maybe increase um, whatever the earning um, capacity is. If I could add that DHCD and HUD, um, I know housing authorities were also at the table because most of the folks that you're talking about come from public housing that have that. They're trying to get out, they're trying to become employed. But again, because of there's so many barriers. And so the cliff effect, we're part of that team working with them um, with Springfield Works. So thank you for bringing that up, Katrina and Janae for responding. My next question is from an anonymous attendee, but um, they start with, thank you to all the panelists. This webinar has been eye-opening. I'm currently a student at BU. And I'm wondering if there are ways that a student, we as students, can support change like legislation for universal child care. Join the Common Start Coalition. I will put the uh, website um, in there as well. Again, uh, we actually represent the um, BU Northeastern and another university is actually part of our higher ed. Uh, department. That's my my colleague. I don't cover that department, but there's actually going to be some work coming out from the membership there. And I'm hoping that one, it'll trickle down to the students, but I can put in again, the, um, the website, there's a link to either share your child care story. So if you have a personal child care story or child care barriers that you're facing, or you just want to uplift and talk about the important role of having access to high quality child care, you can share that there. And if you want to formally join the coalition, uh, there's also a tab there. And I'm going to make sure I put that in the link again, because I know folks are uh, asking a lot of questions and it could have gotten lost. And another uh, BU student asks, are there any federal bills we can support to address the, weight, the race wage gap? Well, um, at a national level, although we have, we have a paid leave provision here in Massachusetts, Having paid sick and family leave pass nationally, and I know, and I'm happy to share. There's organizations like Plus um, and others that are trying to pass paid leave for all. That is, lack of access to mandated paid leave is one of the main reasons that, at least for mothers or caregivers of an elder, um, which of course has a disproportionate effect in the Black and Brown communities why people drop out of the workforce and often can't get back in or can't get back in at levels um, that allow them to, to grow and um, you know, kind of achieve economic parity. So that is happening right now. There's a big push to get national paid leave made permanent instead of just a temporary provision through COVID. Mm -hmm. And Daisy, did you want to add to that? Um, so there are federal bill efforts that um, the wage equity now is supporting. Um, but, you know, federal efforts is great, but, you know, also don't, uh, you know, avoid getting away from local efforts. And our local efforts is uh, join the wage equity now coalition. So if you belong to a company organization that's in alignment with our mission of transparency and accountability, that would result in closing the racial and gender 
based wage gaps, then um, please join us. Go to our website, wageequitynow.com slash coalition and fill out the quick form at the very bottom to um, sign up and we'll be in touch. We're trying to build a diverse coalition that is bringing together uh, businesses, labor unions, philanthropic organizations, nonprofit, multi-service organizations, and social justice groups to make the case as to why transparency is imperative in the Commonwealth and can help us usher in a new generation of change and hopefully serve as a model to the rest of the US um, as to you know, cultivating this culture of transparency and accountability. So a lot of things can start local and expand broader. So um, sign up. And don't go anywhere because I have another question um, <laughs> for you, Ms. Ndugaba. Um, how does one go about finding mentors? Um, well, it's, there are different ways, but first, uh, you know, you can find mentors in whatever it is that you aspire to. So for example, when I was in college and I was considering a career in corporate law, what I did was um, I looked into the alumni in my college and um, I contacted women partners, actually women attorneys, but at different levels of their careers. I reached out to two different partners who were 20, 25 years into their careers to ask them about their experience. I reached out to people who were mid-level and also people who were recent grads and had just entered um, the career. And I just wanted to sort of learn about their pro progression, their experiences at different generations. And so that's one way, um, identifying people who are in the space that you want to occupy and reach out to them to figure out, like hold informational interviews to figure out what was their path, What's their guidance? What are some mistakes that they made? So you can, so you can avoid those same pitfalls. And um, it's important to have, you know, mentors who are not only seasoned and veterans in their career, but who are also new and sort of can understand where you're coming from. So seek out people from different generations. Um, you know, feel free to leverage the power of, you know, resources like LinkedIn, Clubhouse is, you know, up and coming these days and it offers a lot of guidance and um, just don't, don't shy away from reaching out to folks. Most of the time people are more than willing and excited to talk about themselves and get to learn about um, somebody who's sort of um, up and coming. Thank you so much. My next question comes from Mike. What advice do you give high school students high school mothers to focus on their education and to avoid early childhood parenting? I know I see some pauses to jump in, but I'll jump in. <laughs> Stay busy, right? Stay busy, get involved. Uh, you know, especially while you don't have children, right? The world is your muse. And so that is a time to pique, you know, your interest and do some positive experimenting with extracurricular activities. I think that's very important. Um, I also think that age appropriate and medically accurate um, parenting um, or sex education is very important. Again, age appropriate and medically accurate, um, you know, is one of the things that I think is very important, but, you know, staying busy, filling your time with positive um, activities and surrounding yourself with positive people. If that's, you know, a goal to make sure that you avoid that. Um, Can I? Oh, sorry, go ahead. My, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I, I was just going to add one piece to that. Um, I started working while I was in high school, um, you know, part-time as, as many of us had. And by, by doing that, I had some industry experience, like I started in retail sales, and then I started working in market research firms um, by the time I was 16. And what was really pretty magical for me, because I had to put myself through college, was that I was able to get a part-time job in a pretty large company that had tuition reimbursement. So my college was largely paid for, as long as I had a grade high enough grade in each class um, through tuition reimbursement. So I was working like a 25, 30 hour week all the way through college. So I try to share that with other like students, high school students, college level students, because I think it's a hidden source of funding that a lot of people aren't aware of. 
Um, yeah, I will add that uh, I'm, I was chuckling because my dad asked the question, so I am so flustered right now. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, well, for one, um, I would just say to, you know, I was 15, 10 years ago, I'm 25, so it doesn't feel like that long ago, but I would say uh, don't be in a hurry to grow up. Um, I was growing up like you see people who are in college or just older and they're just doing things and uh, you want to, you know, get there. But, you know, now having bills and other things, it's not, it's not all that. So don't be. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and I, I think I have more of an advice for parents rather than like young kids. Cause they're at the end of the day, they're teenagers, but, you know, create a nurturing warm environment for your kids because oftentimes kids seek out external sources that they're not receiving at home and there are even studies that people get into certain things and want to create families from a young age or whatever the case may be because they're so desperate to love someone so um, just create that nurturing environment um, don't consider certain topics taboo to talk about because sometimes if we're keeping things hush hush or taboo kids are more eager to rebel and you know, get themselves involved in certain things. So just create that warm, nurturing environment. And I think naturally that will rub off on your, your team. Thank you. I have a couple more questions. I'm hoping we can get to these last two before we have to wrap up. But Deborah's asking if there's anywhere women, working women can get legal advice about their civil rights when discriminated, harassed, retaliated, and not promoted or fired unfairly. Um, many times they need to know how to document these violations and unfairness toward them when employers do not. Do you have any advice for Deborah? MCAD, uh, I think Mass Commission Against Discrimination could be very helpful. Uh, it was helpful for me back when I went through a situation um, because I had a manager who had a preference of male uh, staff over female staff and what the implications were uh, in the workplace. So I would say MCAD. I would say when there's any issues of um, pay uh, inequity or discrimination related to your pay, we do have a website through the treasurer's office called um, equalpayma.com where we talk about the equal pay law and what, your, what the law protects you from. And we also have an anonymous email tool if you wanted to send um, your employer an anonymous email just to kind of flag like, hey, this is something you might wanna check out. We have an employer toolkit on that website as well that's downloadable. Um, and then also, we also provide the information to the AG's office, so the Attorney General, um, you can contact their office too when you feel like there may be some discrimination or something that you might wanna get. Um, looked into, um, but definitely lean into anybody in your safe spaces and, and mentors that can maybe advise you on what to do and how to document things. And then my last question, I think we talked a little bit about it, but it's um, a student from BU who's asking for the younger generation who wants to get involved for um, fighting for uh, children and against family poverty, how would you advise them to get started? Um, I'll, I'll just mention one organization that I have done some volunteering with in the past, I think is incredible, uh, Horizons for Homeless Children. They have a program that really helps people who are marginalized often and, and often black and brown uh, families have access to free childcare so that they can come from public assistance and have access uh, to work. Um, they have a, like play space coordinator. So they, and I'm not sure of the protocols during COVID, but they were always taking volunteers for people that wanted to like play with children, uh, which of course is really fun anyway, and help out the families in those programs. And I, I'm a huge fan of their work. Well, that wraps up all of the questions we have and it's perfect timing. We are at 11.59 on the dot. Um, in closing, I would just like to thank you all on behalf of 
on behalf of OEE, the Mass Commission on Status of Women, and May Walk, thank you all so much for participating in our conversation this, this morning. Now we're ending in afternoon. Thank you to all of our attendees. For those of you on Zoom, please, please, please take a moment when you exit to fill out our survey. That helps us improve these conversations and these programs that we host on Equal Pay. And again, if you're registered, you will receive the link to our recording and all of the awesome resources we talked about today. Um, thank you again for attending and we hope to see you next time. Thank you again and have a good afternoon.